Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my show, Coronavirus Update by Hirak, uh, for April 30, 2020. Uh, before I start, um, I wanted to say it was uh, rewarding and encouraging and, and happy to see uh, President uh, Donald Trump agree with me uh, that this COVID-19 is a lab-created uh, virus. Uh, I'm arguing that um, COVID-19 is a biological targeted weapon uh, that represents genetic modification of a virus um, by the Chinese Red Army. And you can see my episode from yesterday to see why I believe that and what the uh, reasons are. And then you can make your own decision yourself. Uh, but it was good to see that President Trump today uh, say um, publicly and on news that he believes that COVID-19 is a um, um, lab created uh, virus. Uh, and also that uh, he disagreed with the intelligence community, which disagree with that. Now, I think, you know, US intelligence is good, but not in terms of China. U.S. intelligence haven't been able to penetrate the Chinese Red Army or the Chinese government. Um, and, uh, you know, China is a homogeneous country, ethnically homogeneous, racially homogeneous, uh, at least a governing body. And so, and most of the population, if not all. Uh, and so um, it's hard to um, penetrate a country like that. And it's been homogeneous for like, what, 5,000 plus years. Uh, with shared history, shared um, identity, shared culture, shared food. You know, it's hard to penetrate a culture like that. It's kind of like Korea. We have a shared culture, identity, language for 5,000 years. It's hard to really penetrate that. So uh, there's a historical force of thousands of years, you know, of, of kind of unity and shared history. And you can't really um, uh, undo that force. You know, it's a type of a force that is an unspoken force, but it exists. Uh, and so, um, yes, there's power in diversity, but there's also power in uh, unity or shared history, shared identity. Uh, and uh, whereas we in the United States, we have to try to create a shared identity. In China, they don't have to create any identity, it exists. So which identity do you think is stronger? Identity do you, that you have to artificially create or identity that is naturally there, actively and passively. Uh, obviously, identity that is actively and passively there without having to discuss it is going to be a stronger identity. Uh, and that's why Chinese people are united. Uh, you're not going to be able to penetrate Chinese uh, government. Um, you know, and so, so that's, uh, you know, so I don't really trust what is coming out of intelligence um, in terms of COVID-19, because they're not gonna be able to, to find out what that is, whether it was creating or a lab or not, they're not gonna find out. Um, obviously, I'm arguing that COVID-19 is a, a biological uh, weapon that is intentionally created by uh, China uh, that targets certain genetic makeup of people. And I'm saying that it's heterogeneity, uh, which is convenient uh, because China is homogeneous. So any virus that targets heterogeneity um, uh, will not target Chinese people. Uh, and so we see that, uh, and I shared this with you yesterday, watch yesterday's video uh, to find out. Uh, when we look at all the numbers of death in Asia, we see that there, not many people have died, you know? And, you know, people talk about how South Korea is contact tracing and doing all these right things. Maybe so, but when we look at other Asian countries which are not doing any of that, um, they still don't have that many deaths. So how do you explain that? They're not doing anything. And I talked about that yesterday. So watch yesterday's show and see. Uh, we're talking about number of people, hundreds dying or thousand dying in a country of one billion. And they're not doing anything to prevent the spread. They're not isolating, they're not, social distancing, so how come they're not getting infected? 
You see what I'm saying? Uh, and so uh, when we look at um, country to compare country and compare country to country, we have to come up with a, a rational deduction, right? We're rational beings, we're thinking beings. So we have to rationally decide why is something happening in this situation when it's not happening in that situation? If a virus is acting same everywhere in the world, then we should have similar levels of uh, infection, similar levels of death in every country, right? Uh, and if there are extra factors that will change that, such as better medicine, uh, then countries which have better medicine should have less death. But with COVID-19, that is not the case. Right now, the United States has the most number of deaths, and we have the greatest science technology. We have the best infection control in the world. So why is it that the most of the number of people dying in the world is America? And third world countries with no infection control have hardly anybody die. How is that possible? It's not logical right it's not scientifically rational because obviously places where infection can happen easily should be the place where people are getting infected and dying and that was the case of uh, spanish flu pandemic of 1918 people in poor countries were dying because they didn't have in, uh, uh, infection control they didn't have good technology they did not have good science they did not have good hospitals good nurses and doctors and medicine so uh, more than 50 million people died in global pandemic of 1918, Spanish flu pandemic. And most of them were in third world countries. Most of the over 50 million people who died were in third world countries. And this happened for two years. In two years, over 50 million people died. But COVID-19 that's happening in 2020 seems to be completely different. Because you're looking at poor countries, third world countries in Asia, third world countries in Africa. There aren't hardly anybody dying. One unifying factor is that people are racially homogeneous. In Africa, if you go to like African countries, they're, they've been 100% black race for thousands of years. If you go to Asian countries, they've been 100% Chinese or 100% Korean, 100% Japanese, 100% Indian for thousands of years. So one unifying factor is that there's racial homogeneity in Asia and Africa, third world countries, where there are not that many good doctors or, 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 or nurses, medication, infection control. In third world countries, not pe too many people are dying, but there is one commonality. It is racial homogeneity. And so if you create a virus in a lab that targets racial heterogeneity, like mixed mixture of races, then this would explain it. Because in the United States, we have a lot of different races who've married, intermarried for past you know, hundreds of years. Uh, and uh, in England, we have a lot of intermarriage as well. Uh, in France, Spain, uh, Italy, there have been a lot of people, there's a lot of, been a lot of racial mixtures. If you see history, their history, history of Western civilization. Uh, and even in Europe, countries where there are racial homogeneity, like Scandinavian countries, um, uh, Germany, there aren't that many deaths from COVID. So um, if the Chinese Red Army created this in the lab. It makes logical sense why this is targeting certain people, but it's not targeting everybody, right? Obviously, there's a targeted going on if third world countries without infection control, without antibiotics, without antiviral medication, without science, without nurses, without ventilators, they're not getting it, they're not dying from it, right? I mean, you have to look at everything rationally and beginning of science is observation, right? That's how Darwin came up with his theories by observing 
The first step in any science is observation. You have to observe. And from your observation, you've got to make a hypothesis. And then you've got to try to prove your hypothesis. And that's the scientific method. So the step one is always assessment. You can assess your environment. You can observe your environment, right? And with COVID-19 being a global pandemic, you have to observe what's going on everywhere, right? So that's the strength of my show, COVID-19 Update by Iraq. Uh, and that's why you should watch it every day. You should subscribe to this YouTube channel because I discuss issues with a vantage point of looking at the forest. I'm not just looking at one tree, like one country, United States. I'm looking at the forest filled of trees that represent United States, Korea, Japan, China, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, uh, Pakistan, you know, and African countries, Kenya, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast. You know, my cousin is a Christian missionary in Sierra Leone. And he's been a Christian missionary for, for, uh, for most of his life after graduating from seminary. And his wife went there and all my ne nephews and uh, niece uh, grew up in, um, in Africa. So they know Africa more than they know Korea. Uh, they're called Korean citizens, but they've been living in Africa, in Sierra Leone. And then they, when, when there were several wars in Sierra Leone, they went to uh, Ivory Coast and did some Christian missionary work there. They came back to Sierra Leone as soon as the Civil War uh, was over. They love Sierra Leone so, and the people there. So, uh, they, and they, they've sacrificed all their life for Sierra Leone, uh, sharing the gospel. Uh, and a lot of people became Christians uh, through their work, especially in villages. And um, yeah, my, my nephew was talking about Juju Man. <laughs> uh, there are Juju Man in uh, Sierra Leone, my nephew was saying, and they put a curse on you through black magic uh, and then you you end up dro dropping dead because there's magic in the war, right? There is black magic. Uh, we know that from Haiti, uh, uh, Haiti's black magic has been proven to exist. It's not a lie. You know, some Westerner progressives think like, you know, magic in Haiti is a lie and that people are backwards. Uh, that's because they don't believe in the supernatural world. Uh, but, uh, you know, scientific examination and assessment have shown that unexplainable events happened uh, and it still happened. Uh, and so um, in Sierra Leone, where my cousin is a missionary, my, my nephew lived there all his life. Uh, and um, he was saying there are juju men in villages and they put a curse and people dropped dead. People against whom the juju men, who's like a magic man, uh, put a curse, they dropped dead. So these things happen in real life. I mean, you know, how are you going to explain it? You know, you can try to deny it based on your, you know, white, liberal, progressive, elitist, Ivy League educated perspective, but your perspective is biased, right? There's a, uh, you have a bias that you have to recognize, you know, and not all reality is based on your bias, right? Your, your Harvard liberal educated, uh, progressive, uh, positions and look at the world is not what the world is like. Most of the world actually doesn't operate from that plane. You know, most of the world operates from a more of a traditional cultural value system rather than a synthetic or, or you know, maybe even fake or artificial, um, you know, education created kind of a culture or perspective or a worldview. That's less than 1% of the world, 1% of the world's population, you know? Uh, I mean, just China alone has 1 billion people, more than that, India as well. And in those countries, not many people are dying. In India, less than 2,000 people died and they have over 1 billion. Uh, and so, um, but yeah, so, so there's something with this COVID-19 virus that is uncanny uh, and that is strange. And we need to be rational about this. There are white liberal, uh, Western educated individuals who have like Ivy League education who are constantly coming up to TV and saying, um, yeah, this pandemic is everywhere the same. And it's a lie. They're assuming that based on their scientific research and their idea of what a virus should be doing to all human beings, it should be treating all human beings the same. But when you look at what's going on in 
India, Korea, Japan, Philippines, um, Kenya, Nigeria. Th there aren't that many people dying. So obviously this is not following the basic rules of science or virus that these uh, white liberal progressive with uh, uh, Ivy League education are used to, right? But because they have a bias, right? They have this bias blind spot they're not willing to consider other possibilities. Uh, the fact that this may be not something that is normal or usual, uh, and I'm arguing that COVID-19 was created in a lab as a next generation biological WMD, weapons of mass destruction, with the primary goal of targeting United States and NATO countries, uh, like England, Germany, Italy, and Spain uh, in order to destroy it. So this is a preemptive uh, strike. It's not a preemptive nuclear strike because obviously we'll retaliate with our nuclear weapons, but this is a preemptive uh, strike in order to destroy NATO. Uh, and so that, watch this was this episode, it's more expansive, but I think it's, it's um, Whenever we look at the world and we try to assess what's going on, I think I am more right than those who are saying this virus is treating everybody equally, because that's a lie. Just compare different countries and how many people are getting infected and dying. How come they're not getting infected? How come they're not dying when they're not even social distancing? I mean, nobody's social distancing in, in many of these third world countries. They're not getting infected, they're not dying. This is not like the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed over 50 million people from third world countries. This is not one of those. So that's a normal virus. That was a uh, Spanish flu, like an influenza virus. And obviously normal virus doesn't discriminate whether you are of different race or you are racially mixed or racially not mixed, uh, whether you are Korean, black, uh, Asian, white, or Hispanic, it, it doesn't discriminate, it just kills everybody. And not too many people died in America because we have superior science and we have superior medication and, and we were able to do infection control, which third world countries did not. That's a normal pandemic. That's a normal virus or uh, that normal, normal, uh, living organism following rules of science. But what we have in COVID-19, it's not normal. That's why I'm saying it's created in a lab. And I'm arguing, I'm taking a step further than President Trump, that it was created intentionally as a, a biological weapon with the intention of targeting NATO countries to destroy it. Well, watch yesterday's show, that's my theory. See if my theory is something that makes sense to you. You could accept it or reject it, that's your freedom. But I think my theory is becoming more and more convincing in light of what's going on and what these liberal scientists, uh, you know, progressive scientists uh, are saying that everybody is suffering the same. It's just a lie, they're not, right? If everybody's suffering the same, there should be thousands of, tens of thousands of deaths everywhere, but we don't see that. Why is it that it's only like NATO countries where we have like tens of thousands of deaths? Why? Ask yourself that. You cannot check your rationality at the door. You cannot check your logic at the door. You have to use your brain to assess the situation. And that's why this show is superior to CNN, Fox News, uh, BBC, Sky News, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Politico, because I use rational human explanations to understand the reality around us. I'm not going to be like biased and say, oh, virus cannot be uh, created from a lab, right? Uh, uh, you know, I, and I'm not going to be uh, prejudiced or, or biased uh, and say, oh, virus can never discriminate, right? Because it's, it's operating from a biased vantage point, a prejud prejudiced, prejudging vantage point that they're assuming based on their study of science, but I'm saying science might have been used to create 
a superior biological weapon in the form of COVID-19. But because it's an artificial weapon, it's not going to operate according to rules of science. And I think my theory is proving correct because you don't have that many deaths in third world countries. And if this virus is infecting everybody equally, then it should be killing everybody uh, all over the third world and it's not doing that. So yeah, so I would argue, you know, I would encourage you to see yesterday's episode and, and make sure you subscribe and watch every episode. So I think you, and this will help you. Um, because you need to understand what's going on in order to survive. If you don't understand what's going on, you're not going to be able to survive, right? Yeah. Well, so that's something that you got to think about. Um, in order to be intelligent like Harry, you need to think in a logical and rational way. You cannot check your brain at the door, right? You cannot operate from your bias. It doesn't matter if it's a bias created at an Ivy League university. You have to think rationally, right? Because everybody has a bias. And if you came through like an Ivy League or liberal elite university, then you have a bias that was inculcated and crystallized in that setting. And you gotta kind of take a step back or a few steps back and say, hey, 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 what's my bias? What's my uh, blind spot? You know, it's like Jihari Square. What's my blind spot? How come I'm not understanding this really the, uh, accurately? You know, because first step in anything is assessment. And that's the first, first step of nursing process, assessment. You have to be able to assess and you cannot bring your biases into assessment, right? You need to, you need to, to have the patient speak to you and tell you what the problems are. Uh, because pain is what the patient says the pain that it is, right? And so it's like this, when you're assessing the world with COVID-19, you have to set, uh, assess the world by the merits of, of its own reality. Meaning, what is it, what's going on now in Sierra Leone? What's going on in South Korea? What's going on in India? What's going on in Pakistan? You have to let the data speak for itself before you use your bias to make a judgment on the data. And that's prejudice, right? That is bias. And that's what Jihari Square warns against. And some of you have done bias training. And unfortunately, even people who have gone, gone through bias training, many of them, they're not able to step outside of their own bias zone. And that's the sad thing. And that is a sad thing because you cannot solve a problem like COVID-19 unless you step out of your bias zone and let the data speak for itself. And that's why this show is so much more important for you and your family than CNN, Fox News, um, BBC, because I consider all possible realities. And I'm glad to see President Trump uh, agreeing with me that um, COVID-19 is created in a lab. Obviously, I'm taking it a step further and saying it's, it's an intentional uh, biological weapon that is a next generation weapon that was purposely meant to target United States and native countries. That's my official stance. That's my theory. Obviously, you know, right now, uh, even scientists don't know what COVID-19 is. Today, I saw a channel with CNN and there were experts saying that we need like six months to understand this thing. And so there are people saying that now, there are experts all over the world saying we don't really know what COVID-19 is. We need six more months to, to begin to understand that. And you know how many people have died in America? You know, before we go to the, the screen uh, that shows how many people died in America in 24 hours, today uh, is part of Ramadan. So you see uh, Ramadan there. Ramadan is from April 23rd to May 23rd. It's like one month where uh, Muslims celebrate. It's the holiest month for Muslims. But anyway, uh, because uh, Ramadan uh, is the holiest month for Muslims, today we're going to look at COVID-19 death in Muslim countries. But before going on to Muslim countries, uh, let's look at our own country, United States of America. Uh, and so we see that um, in the last 24 hours, over 2,000 people have died. 
precisely speaking, 2,125 people have died. And that is a bad news because we had over 2,000 people die yesterday as well. So I think, and you know, if you remember during the Passion Week, uh, the Holy Week, we had over 2,000 people die every day, right? Or around 2,000 people die every day. So yesterday and today combined, we had over 4,000 deaths in two days in United States of America, a country of 330 million people, whereas in India, a country over 1 billion people, total number of death through this whole time is less than 2,000, less than what we have today. This is why I'm saying COVID-19 is an intentional, biological, next generation weapon of mass destruction intentionally created by the Chinese Red Army. And it is successfully targeting United States and NATO countries, unfortunately. Uh, but before we recognize the reality, we can't solve the problem, right? If you keep thinking this is a natural virus, just following a natural pattern, then you're not going to have to solve it. I'm arguing that this is a manipulated, genetically modified virus uh, that doesn't follow natural rules of nature. And so that I'm arguing is the very important first step we need to take in order to find the solution to stop the deaths. You gotta know what it is in order to find the solution. If you don't know what the problem is, how are you gonna find the solution? And this is why I'm the Leonardo da Vinci of the 21st century. Because I asked questions that mere mortals cannot even begin to ask. And I assure you, a lot of people are gonna to come to my position. If you see this show since the beginning, you will see that a lot of people have come to see my way because a lot of people are watching this show and, and I created this show to save you and your children from COVID-19. And I encourage all the experts, scientists, biomedical researchers, researchers on vaccines, uh, US Department of Defense, the Pentagon to watch this show every day because you're not gonna get the insights that I give you because nobody in your team have the mental capacity that I have, because I'm the Leonardo da Vinci of my generation, actually of the 21st century. Look at all my education. Watch the past shows to see how much I have accomplished in history, in life. I am currently the co-chair of the program committee of Virginia Council of Teachers of Mathematics. It's the statewide Virginia uh, math organization for teachers and professors who teach math from pre-kindergarten students to PhD students in math. That includes University of Virginia, College of William and Mary. Uh, my fellow co-chair is a professor at George Mason University who taught math there for over 15 years. Um, so look at what I have accomplished in the field of math. Uh, and I edit articles submitted by professors of universities to a magazine such as child, Teaching Children Mathematics, The Mathematics Teacher, Middle School uh, Mathematics Teacher. Uh, and so um, I do this at the national level. And so you can see that I've accomplished a lot in the field of math. In the field of English and literature, um, I'm in the committee uh, on global citizenship that defines what it means to be a global citizen in the United States for all the English and literature teachers from pre-kindergarten to university level. Uh, and so, uh, and, and uh, I've been doing this uh, for a while. I'm a committee board member. Uh, and uh, you can check out my uh, a blog on global citizenship. Um, if you go to my, uh, uh, website www.hirakforcongress.com. You can access several of my blogs that are published uh, on global citizenship and that will help you. So I'm playing a very important leadership role in the United States around the world in defining what global citizen is. Uh, and I'm giving guidance to English teachers, literature teachers, writing teachers around um, the country in all 50 states and US territories like Puerto Rico uh, and Guam on 
on how to teach reading and writing with with view to global citizenship. So, uh, so I'm playing a, a major leadership role in English instruction, research, literature, comparative literature at university level. So Georgetown University English Department would be receiving guidance from our committee at an official level uh, because we're the official professional organization for English and literature and literacy instruction in the country. Uh, and we're the, we're the biggest organization for that purpose. Uh, and so, um, and you know, I, I mentioned Georgetown because I'm at Georgetown University. I'm doing my master's at School of Nursing and Health Studies uh, with a focus on clinical nurse leader. So look at this, I am getting my expertise in the field of nursing and health studies. So I'm doing my master's degree. In my field, my concentration is called clinical nurse leader. Um, and so uh, this semester I've worked with Arlington County uh, uh, Public Health Department, uh, focusing on how to improve uh, Arlington County Public Schools uh, nursing. Uh, and um, so, uh, and also I've worked with um, a Fairfax Hospital uh, dealing with complex nursing problems. And I've solved a lot of uh, important uh, clinical problems uh, there that saved, uh, I'm sure, that saved people's lives. Um, and, uh, and so I have uh, achieved amazing expertise in the, field, in the field that I am in right now, which is called clinical nurse leader. So I intend to play major roles of leadership in that regard, make Georgetown University shine, School of Nursing and Health Studies. So Georgetown should be happy because you're gonna have a flood of great, amazing students with bachelor's degrees applying to this program, Clinical Nurse Leader, in the future as I expand my reach and help people uh, with the knowledge that I got from Georgetown in the area of Clinical Nurse Leader. Uh, I'm an expert of uh, Jewish history, um, and uh, you can Google my name, Hirak Christian Kim, and read all the books that I've written. I've, uh, I've read a lot of peer-reviewed monographs, academic monographs, that have revolutionized the field of uh, Jewish studies. I've applied, uh, I have um, asked to be the chair of uh, the session, several sessions in, uh, uh, in the December annual conference of Association for Jewish Studies, AJS, which is the biggest professional organization for Jewish studies. I've been a member for over 10 years. So I'm asking to be a chair this year because you know, I know my stuff, I'm an expert, I'm respected, I have peer review publications, so I'm a global expert on Jewish studies. So they have annual conferences, this year's annual conferences in Washington, D.C. That's why I was asked uh, to be the chair, because, you know, I, I'm in uh, Arlington, Virginia, so it's right near D.C. Uh, and so just look at all my expertise, field of expertise. You're not going to find somebody who have the expertise that I have, the perspective, experience, and the knowledge, and the wisdom to help you and your family survive COVID-19. There may be people jealous of all the training I have, all the knowledge and wisdom I have. And you know, it's, it's sad that some of you are so jealous and have become, you know, maybe are haters, you know, because I'm trying to help you and your family too. Uh, and uh, so you should not reject my, my offer of wisdom and knowledge to help you and your family and everybody in the United States of America. I say United States of America because obviously India does, is not seeing that many deaths. Korea is not seeing that many deaths. In fact, none of the Asian countries are seeing that many deaths. China, which has the greatest number of deaths, is like around 4,000. And that's how much we have in two days. And in China, that was like from November to now. The total death number is like 4,000 something. In two days, we have more than China's death in all of their COVID-19 experience from November 2019 to now. So can we talk about this being the same problem in China as in the United States or same problem in Korea as in the United States? 
or India as in United States. No, none of these countries are seeing the number of death that we're seeing. And India is definitely bigger than us, three, four times bigger than us. So is China. So why is that the case? Yeah, so um, you need my brains to help you solve it. If I, and you need my brains to give you directions on where to go. Because the problem is a lot of you out there, a lot of you so-called experts out there are biased, operating from white liberal, Ivy League education uh, bias that is limiting you from finding the solution because you are trapped in your bias, right? Because you cannot see any other way except the little box that you're in. You're looking at the world from your little pond and you're saying, my little pond is what the world is like. And that's not the world. As I said, the perspectives that liberal white progressives have, that represents less than 1% of the 1% of the world's population. Majority of the world do not think like you. They think more like me. You know, uh, I would say over 90% of the world think like me, not like you. I mean, I'm Ivy League educated, but as I've explained, I'm a traditional Christian who believes uh, in traditional values, like uh, one woman should marry one man. Uh, I oppose gay marriage. I oppose homosexuality for society. I see that as detrimental. I agree with Romans chapter one. And I'm saying over 90% of the world agrees with me on this. I guarantee it, because Islam agrees on me with me. Hinduism agrees with me. Buddhism agrees with me. Christianity agrees with me. Jainism agrees with me. Every religion in the world agrees with me on this point, that uh, homosexuality is not good for society. Uh, and so who's right? Uh, you or me? If, if you're one of those people who think homosexuality is good for society, obviously you're wrong, right? If we look at it from the perspective of numbers, pure numbers, you know, I have the support of over 90% of the world's population. You have the support of less than 1%. Even in America, majority of America agrees with me, not with you. You know, I mean, geez. <laughs> uh, so in terms of numbers game, most likely you're wrong. If we just look at it purely from numbers game, you're wrong. All the religions agree with me, not with you. Why is that? The religious texts. Because you're wrong. So looking at it from a religious perspective, religious textual perspective, religion ethics perspective, you're wrong. I'm right. Right? Um, uh, looking at it from history perspective, in the last 5,000 years of US history, Western civilization, boom, 99% of US history, world civilization history agrees with me, doesn't agree with you. So who's wrong? Who's right? You're operating from your bias, your limited pond. You think that's the way it should be for the world. And you're wrong. I am right. I'm just saying, you know? Uh, and so, um, and those of you out there watching this show know, because you agree with me, right? Majority of you out there watching this show agree with me. Even those of you who may say X, Y, and Z, Deep in your heart, you agree with me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, I have spoken at Arlington uh, Republican Committee and Alexandria Republican Committee opposing homosexuality and gay marriage on a public platform. Obviously, you know, majority of Republicans agree with me on this. Uh, and many, many Democrats, even majority of Democrats believe that homosexuality is wrong. You know, I, so I have the support of, Bipartisan support in terms of population of people who vote. Majority of America agrees with me. Uh, but this is my official political position. So if you, you know, you can politically affiliate with me and nobody has a right to discriminate against you, right? For your political affiliation in supporting here at Christian Kim for US Congress in Virginia's 8th District. I'm running for US Congress in Virginia's 8th District, as you know. And general election is November 3rd, 2020. Um, I'm running against the current congressman, Don Beyer, who's a Democrat, who believes in gay marriage, who supports homosexuality. I oppose that. So uh, I have the right to, uh, to oppose that publicly uh, and not be persecuted for it, right? Those who persecute me are the ones who are wrong, 
right? Because they have no respect for my political affiliation, uh, my right to my political views, uh, my freedom of speech guaranteed under the first constitution. And they're more importantly violating civil rights law. Doesn't matter if they're an individual, uh, a group of individuals, uh, or if they're a university or a professional organization, it doesn't matter. Um, if you violate my right to my religion and my uh, political affiliation, then you're violating uh, civil rights laws of the United States of America, right? And I mean, you could be thrown into jail. You could, you know, not just find, find, pay a fine, but you see, I mean, and I'm happy to take this all the way to the Supreme Court, you know, uh, because I'm right and you're wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, majority of Americans agree with me, they don't agree with you. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's why I'm publicly speaking out loud at uh, Arlington Republican Committee meeting and Arling, uh, Alexandria uh, Republican Committee meeting uh, saying homosexuality is, is not good, gay marriage is not good. Because majority of Americans agree with me. Most of the police officers in Arlington, Alexandria Falls Church at Fairfax County agree with me as well. So, and most of the people in the US military agree with me. Uh, so, you know, if, if you think gay marriage is right and uh, homosexuality is right, you're like less than 1% of America's population. You have no popular mandate, you have no right. Uh, if you're gonna violate my right, then obviously your right goes into question, right? Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, this is a war you cannot win because you represent less than 1% of America's population less than 1% of the 1% of world's population. There's no way you can win this argument. Uh, so don't even try, you know? I have the backing of the religious text of every major religion in, in the world and the people who follow them, which are billions of people. And so, uh, yeah, don't push it. You know, there are people who like to push their liberal progressive agenda, uh, thinking that they're God. You're not God, I'm my God and I call him Jesus Christ. You're not my God, you're not gonna tell me what to believe when Bible, Romans chapter one, condemns homosexuality. You can't tell me that I need to oppose Romans chapter one. The Vatican, the Pope, agrees homosexuality is wrong and that no homosexual can be a priest, a clergy in the Roman Catholic Church, that's one billion Catholics. So every Catholic University of America, Georgetown University, uh, Marymount University, Notre Dame University in Indiana, uh, Santa Clara University in California, Loyola Marymount University in California, uh, Loyola University in Chicago, all of you must take the Bible position that homosexuality is wrong, gay marriage is wrong, as an official position of your university. And it is by default, because you're Catholic universities, you know, Georgetown is a Jesuit university, so officially, Jesuit university holds that homosexuality and gay marriage is wrong. It's against the Bible. That's an official position of the Catholic Church. Therefore, it is official position of Georgetown University, right? So that's something that you cannot forget. Don't think like you're right. You're wrong. I'm right. You're wrong. And so, um, yeah. So let's get that straight because there seem to be some people who think that Georgetown University is not a Catholic university. No, it's a Catholic university and it's a Jesuit university with Catholic values and Jesuit values. So let's not forget that, you know, uh, and Catholic church officially condemns homosexuality as being wrong and officially reject any homosexual from having the right to become a priest in the Catholic church just because they're homosexuals. So let's get that straight. That's the official position of Georgetown University that's the official position of Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. Let's not forget this. That is the official position of every priest in Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax uh, County. And that's the position that is expected of every Catholic in Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax County. And it's in Romans 1. It's not just Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, Methodists. Your religious text, Romans 1, says, homosexuality is wrong, gay marriage is wrong. So if you're gonna call yourself Christian, you gotta follow your religious text. Don't call yourself a Christian if you're not gonna 
follow Romans 1. So uh, let's get this straight, uh, clear right now, because either you, you well, you, you can't even go to your church now. God has closed all your churches down. So um, that's the reality now. But it seems like COVID-19 is, is hurting Americans and Europeans, which are pro-gay uh, nations at an official level. Uh, nations that legalize gay marriage and kind of aggressively push homosexuality. These are the nations that are kind of suffering the most. Um, so does that contradict my theory that COVID-19 is a Chinese biological weapon? No, it doesn't. Because God is in control. So if I'm supposed to speak from a spiritual perspective, I'm arguing that God allowed China to successfully create this biological weapon that would work so that it achieves God's judgment of punishing nations that are legalizing gay marriage and homosexuality and encouraging homosexuality in their populations. So this fits my argument, right? So this fits as a system. God's in control. God can prevent China from creating a normative, functional, uh, next generation biological weapon called COVID that can achieve what it is intended to do, or God can make that successful. If you read in the Bible, book of Jeremiah and Isaiah, it says God raised up Israel's enemies to destroy Israel. Read book of Jeremiah, I'm not lying to you. Read book of Jeremiah. It says God raised up Israel's enemies in order to destroy Israel because Israel has turned away from God. Israel has turned away from Torah. So Hashem, God, has chosen to punish Israel. Hashem, God, has chosen to destroy Israel. And what method did Hashem, God, use to destroy Israel? The first temple. How did God destroy the first temple? By giving power, power to Israel's enemies. And it's right there on the text. I'm not creating this. I'm not making this up. Go read the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. God gave power to the enemies in order to destroy the nation that is going against the Bible. That's what Jeremiah is saying. And that's the modus operandi of God. That's how God operates. And that's why from a spiritual perspective, you need to be right with God. You need to be right with God. We as United States have to be right with God. That's why America needs to go back to God. Because God can stop this tomorrow if he wants. God controls the viruses. The viruses cannot proliferate unless God allows it to. Obviously, God is allowing COVID-19 to proliferate in the United States of America and throughout European nations. Because have America repented to God and illegalized gay marriage or homosexuality yet? Have England illegalized gay marriage or homosexuality yet? Well, there's your answer. What is God's incentive to stop this COVID-19 from spreading and doing its damage in the United States and, and England when you're not giving God what he wants? God gave you Romans 1. And in Romans 1, God promised wrath of God for homosexuality. So put two and two together. If you illegalize homosexuality and gay marriage, God can make all of this go away. But obviously that's not happening in the United States. That's not happening in the United Kingdom. So why do you think God will let COVID go away on its own? What incentive does God have? You're not giving God what he wants. Why should he give you what you want? Why should God give you what you want when you're not giving God what he wants? The Bible is very clear. You believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. You don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. God's love is always conditional. God's love is never unconditional. If you do not give God what, God what he wants, he's not going to give you what you want. It's very simple. 
in order for you to go to heaven, you have to, to say, Jesus, I believe you. Come into my heart and save me. If you do not do that, God's not going to save you. You have to do what God wants you to do, which is to admit that you're a sinner, that you need salvation, and the salvation is only through Jesus, unless you admit that God's not going to save you. Give God what he wants. He will give you what you want. God's love is always conditional. And this principle is found in the covenant of Abraham. God said to Abraham, circumcise your children and keep the, uh, you know, keep the covenant. And then I will bless you and your uh, descendants. So it's a condition, right? You have to circumcise and you have to keep the covenant, laws and rules of the covenant. Uh, you can read my book. Um, uh, uh, you know, Jewish law. Um, you know, I've written several books on Jewish law. Just Google my name, Hira Christian Kim, and you can read any of my books. Um, and several of my books discuss this issue, conditional love of God as found in uh, the Bible, right? So those of you who are teaching that God's love is unconditional, you should stop because you're wrong. Bible never teaches God's love is unconditional, never, anywhere. Right In the New Testament, it says you have to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior in order for you to be saved. That's the gospel. God's love is always conditional. You have to do something in order to be saved. So if you're saying God's love is unconditional, stop, because you're wrong. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you've been saying that for the past 30 years. You've been wrong for the past 30 years. Old Testament and New Testament clearly shows that God's love is conditional. You have to do something for God, for God to give you something. You have to say, God, I'm a sinner. I repent, come into my heart. You have to do that for God to give you salvation. It's always conditional. He doesn't just give you salvation out of nowhere. Do you see what I mean? God's love is always conditional. So if you've been teaching God's love is unconditional, you haven't been teaching the Bible. You've been teaching your human words. So you've got to stop. And you've got to repent because God sees what you are doing. All right? And Bible is saying, that God's love is conditional. Now, uh, let's go back to where we are. We have 2,125 deaths. So yesterday, total number of uh, people who died was 60,876. Look at all the numbers of death. You're saying that God's not judging America? Are you kidding me? How come China has like 4,000 deaths all this time? For since November. Yeah. Yeah, go on believing in your own lie, you know, uh, that, you know, it's okay to, to uh, disregard Romans chapter one and allow homosexuality to proliferate in America. Go on believing that. God's not going to help you survive COVID. I'm speaking from a spiritual angle, from a Christian religious angle, from a Bible angle. Do you want God's help? Well, then you got to do what God wants you to do. You can't expect God to help you doing what you want to do. You got to give to get something. You got to give God what He wants if you want to get something from God. God's love is always conditional. Um, so we see that today's death rate is much higher 63,001. Now, Confirmed cases is rising a steady rate, about 30,000. Yesterday, the total confirmed cases was 1,038,451. Today's confirmed cases, uh, 1,069,534. America is going toward destruction, people. We have over 30 million Americans, that includes evangelical Christians, Catholics, who are now unemployed since March. Since March, in two months, we have 30 million people who are unemployed who may not be able to pay their rent. America's meat plants are closing because meat workers are getting COVID and dying. In Virginia, where I am, we have problem with chicken, processing plants, Maryland as well. 
food source can be gone. You can die of hunger and starvation. As I've said, get 18 months of non-perishable food stored in your garage just in case. Because in case there's no food, do you want your children to die of hunger? That could happen. You don't think it could happen? Well, you probably don't, didn't think that it could happen that um, everybody would have a stay at home order, right? Have you in million years thought what is going on would happen? So why do you doubt that people can die of hunger in the United States of America one year from now? It can happen. Don't tell me that I didn't warn you. I care about you and your family, so I warned you, told you to get 18 months of non-perishable canned foods and store it in your garage, right, or basement, or some room in your apartment. You heard it from me. I, I've told you that. Uh, so don't go, go saying nobody told you to store food. I'm a leader in Northern Virginia. I'm running for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District as independent candidate for U.S. Congress uh, in the November 3rd general elections in 2020. And I, as your leader, a leader in Virginia, Northern Virginia, have, have called on you and encouraged you to get 18 months of food to protect your family for potential starvation. If you don't listen, then it's your fault. Because I've said it more than once. I've said it several times. Uh, and so why is all this thing happening in America when it's not happening in any other country? Why? Why is it happening in America? And I'm saying you need to look at a spiritual reason too. United States needs to illegalize homosexuality. The United States needs to illegalize gay marriage. From a Christian perspective, that's why Romans chapter 1 demands. And that's what the reality was in America for past uh, most of America's history until you know, a few years ago. That's been the reality in Western civilization. So why do you think morality and ethics suddenly changed? You think God's law changes? God, God changes like that? God's an eternal being. He's never changing. So when God in the Old Testament and New Testament said homosexuality is wrong, you should oppose it. Why do you think God suddenly changed in the year 2020 or 2019 or 2018 or 2017? Why, why do you assume that? It doesn't make sense. So just read Romans chapter 1 again and see what God demands of you. You give God what he wants. He will give you what you want. You do not give God what you, he wants. He will not give you what you want. Very simple. God is currently punishing United States of America for gay marriage and homosexuality. If we are to believe in Romans chapter 1, I believe in Romans chapter 1. You can decide to reject Romans chapter 1, then don't expect God to help you. Because God gave you Romans chapter 1. God told you what he's going to do in Romans chapter 1. If we reject Romans chapter 1, don't go blaming God. Wrath of God that is promised in Romans chapter 1 is in effect right now. People are dying. You're going to have cousins, relatives, maybe parents, children die from this COVID. Because we have 2,125 people dying every day. Over, over that died yesterday. And this is going to keep continuing. How many people do you think will die? We have 63,000 dead right now. This is only April. A few weeks ago, uh, President Trump went on TV and said, by August, we are thinking we may have 100,000 dead. Do you remember that? And some of the people in the media are like, no, we're not going to have 100,000 people dead. That sounds like a large number. Do you remember that? That was a few weeks ago. That was before Easter. People were like, we're not going to have 100,000 people dead by, by uh, August. China only has like three, 4,000 people dead. Do you remember people saying that? Do you remember you saying that? That was only two, three weeks ago. Yes, because you're at staying home every day, you think like time has passed by, but it's only been like two months since this whole thing started in America. Just a few weeks ago, people thought 100 people dying by August was a large number. Now we're looking at possibly 100,000 people dying by, by uh, 
May. By end of May, we may have 100,000 people dead in America. By May. That's how many months ahead of schedule? June, July, August, three months of schedule. I'm still holding to my theory that over 1 million American citizens will die by August. Why? Why do I argue that? Number one, there are many states which just started to have deaths. They're, they're like at the low end and they're, they're slowly rising. Some of them will see the peak of their death in May, June, July, August. Some of them will not even see it until then. So of course the number of deaths are gonna increase because we have 50 states. And currently every state death number is rising. We have no state where there's like no death per day, right? From what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. People are dying everywhere and the death rate is increasing in every state. Virginia, for example, we have like over 500 deaths now, but we're adding every day a certain number of deaths. Same with Maryland, same with uh, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. said they had the greatest number of deaths uh, today. So a month from now, it's going to be far more than 2,125 people will die just at the rate that we're going. Just looking at Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., we may have over 7,000 people dying per day because every state is having an increase of people die. That's where we are in America. That's why I still believe we're gonna have over 1 million deaths by August, 2020 because of the current rate. You know what the second reason is why I believe that we're gonna have over 1 million people die by August? We're beginning to open up the country which I'm not saying is necessarily a bad thing, but I've said before, and I say it again now, when you open up the country, you're gonna have people die in larger numbers. Because this is a, a virus that's whole purpose of the virus is to infect people and kill people, right? That's what COVID-19 does. So I understand why people are opening up because they need money to pay rent and they don't have money. But the moment they open up, the chance of infection will go up. Um, and as number of infections go up, number of deaths will go up. Just logically speaking, there is no cure. There is no vaccine. Scientists are saying they're not going to be able to develop a vaccine for like 18 months. We know that in Spanish influenza of, two, uh, of uh, 1918, over 50 million people died. These things happen in reality. Uh, so don't think that COVID-19 cannot kill over 50 million people. It did in 1918. And Spanish flu was considered a very weak thing compared to uh, COVID-19. Uh, and so, um, so that's the second reason. We're beginning to open up because people need money. They have to pay rent with something. They have to pay for food with something. So People are going back to work. Some of the people are opening up businesses uh, and that's understandable, but because we're doing that, more people are gonna get infected, more people are gonna die. It's just a natural thing. It's a logical thing, right? I mean, it's not like something that you don't expect. You all think about that. Um, and number three, we're gonna have a lot of people go bankrupt. You know, if you're a real estate agent, are you selling any houses now? Censor me. If you're a real estate agent in Arlington and you're not selling any houses, let's say you didn't sell one house in the last two months, March and April, how are you gonna sustain yourself? Let's say this continues to December, which everybody says it will, and Dr. Fauci is saying it's gonna be worse in December, you're probably not gonna sell any more houses until December. So let's say you are a real estate agent in Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax County, Virginia's 8th District, where I'm running for U.S. Congress. Let's say you sell no houses from, uh, from March 2020 to December 2020. How are you going to survive? Especially if you are paying rent on your uh, business 
office, let's say you have a little real estate office that is paying rent, how are you gonna pay the overhead, the rent, electricity, bill, all the bills that you have to pay? And if you lease the car, company car like Mercedes Benz, how are you gonna make the car payments on, on the lease? Right, so you might have made $5 million in 2019 from selling houses, or maybe you may, might have made far more than that. In 2020, you may make nothing or close to nothing. You're not going to be able to pay for anything. That means you would have to foreclose on your loans. You will be evicted from your uh, businesses. Uh, your car will be repossessed. And that's going to happen not just to you. But every single one of you, real estate agents, in Arlington, Alexandria Falls Church and Fairfax County, that's just one industry. There are a lot of different businesses that are closed. You could reopen at the risk of death. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, uh, that's not your right now in Virginia because there's a stay at home order. And, you know, uh, I think you get arrested if you open your business. But, but in, even in states which has opened up, if you open your business, you still have to risk death by contracting COVID. I mean, you may not get it, but you could. I mean, it's a risk. You, it's a greater risk that you're taking. So you're going to have all these real estate agents who are going bankrupt. Now, let's say you just borrowed $300 million to create a office building or condominium and you're expecting to sell all that because amazon's coming here but now nobody's buying nobody's leasing your space what's going to happen to you how are you going to pay your 300 million dollar loan on your your building that you just created where you are expecting to make um you know maybe a billion or more from how are you going to make that up do you see do you see the domino effect or trickle down effect of what's going to happen if you could be a billionaire real estate owner now and you will lose everything that's possible because as you know if you're in the business world you're always borrowing to expand i mean if you're not a businessman you may not understand this but let's say you your net worth is 50 million you may have more than 50 million in loans right now because you are building this building that expanding business but you've made your calculations and because there are people paying rent on your building and there are business transactions going on you have clients you calculate there's no problem still making money because you have revenue coming in every year that are there's hundred maybe tens of millions hundred of million but the problem now is your revenue that you made last year, $200 million in revenue, could go to zero this year. So how are you going to survive? How are you going to pay the $50 million loan, the monthly payments, when the $200 million in revenue you normally get will not be coming in this year? You're going to foreclose on your, your uh, you, you're going to foreclose on everything. Do you see, and this is not just your business, we're talking about thousands of businessmen, tens of thousands of business people who are in the same situation. Everybody's saying this virus will uh, last over 18 months. Spanish flu lasted a couple of years and it killed over 50 million people. So how do you expect your business to survive? Can your business survive even to December? If your business been watching this show and all of your businessmen should be watching this show because here are Christian Kim, that's me, created this show, COVID-19 Update by Hirak to help you and your family and your businesses, not just in Arlington, Alexandria Falls Church and Fairfax County, but throughout the country. You gotta start thinking in practical terms about what's gonna happen to you, what's gonna happen to your businesses, what's gonna happen to your net worth and all the money you have. How about your stocks? How about those of you who own oil stocks? What's happening to your oil stocks now? 
you could have had net worth a billion and let's say you have billion dollars in oil stocks that could all go to zero, zero. Your one billion dollar could dis disappear. This is where we're living. We're not just talking about oil stocks now. The oil stocks is where it's starting. It's starting with oil stocks. But it's going to go to other stocks. Businesses are closed. What do you think will happen to your stocks? I read today uh, in the news that Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos told his stock holders to just sit down. That's how desperate everybody is. Even the wealthiest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, is getting desperate. We don't know what's going to happen to Amazon. It's working now, but you know, we don't know. What do you think is going to have te happen to Tesla? Mr. Elon Musk, an Ivy Leaguer, who became a billionaire creating these cars. Is it possible he loses everything? I don't know. Mr. Elon Musk, you know your life. You know your business. What do you think is going to happen? The owner of Virgin Atlantic, Virgin Australia, is headed toward po uh, poverty. I mean, it, it will take him long to get there because he's a billionaire, but his company is dying one by one. This is happening to all the billionaires in America, all the billionaires in England, all the billionaires all over Europe. Asia is not impacted. Asia's billionaires are not hurting. Because, you know, like in Japan, everybody's going to work. I mean, people are not getting COVID in Asia. They're not, they're, maybe they get it, they're, they're not dying from COVID. Whether it's a poor country or, or wealthy, a uh, wealthier Asian country, nobody's, not many people are dying. Let's go to our Muslim countries in celebration of our Ramadan, holiest month in the Muslim calendar. You see the flag of Iran there. Iran is number one in terms of COVID deaths. Uh, the number of deaths in Iran is 6,208. That's like three days in America. That's the total number of people who died in Iran since the beginning to now, 6,028. That's how many people die in America in three days? Homosexuality is illegal in every Muslim country. Yeah. And it should be illegal in every Christian country. It was illegal in every Christian country until like 30 years ago. Romans chapter one is very clear on Bible's position on homosexuality. For 2,000 years of Christian history, homosexuality was illegal. But let's talk about Muslim countries where homosexuality is illegal. Iran, um, total number of deaths is 6,028. Rank number two is Turkey. Half of that, 3,174. So that's like a day and a half in US. How many would I hear? Number three, Indonesia, 792. One third of the people who died in the last 24 hours in America died in Indonesia, the whole country of 100 million people, one of the poorest countries in the world where nobody's isolating themselves, nobody is really staying at home. There's no infection control. Many villages don't even have medication. They only have 792 deaths. How is that possible? You should be asking yourself. If you're not asking yourself, I don't know, there's something wrong with you. Uh, Algeria is number four at 450 deaths. Number five is Egypt at 392 deaths. Number five, the last place Egypt is only 392 deaths. And you're telling me that this virus is treating every nation equally? Are you still saying that? Don't you feel like an idiot? Now, and I'm not trying to call you an idiot. You know, I'm just saying, you know, I, let's look at the facts here. Let's not say things that are stupid that go against facts and reality. That's all I'm saying. 
Okay? Yeah, let's be smart. Like Harry. Like Harry the owl. Now, we see uh, here, uh, since this is Ramadan, we want to kind of um, study some of the history of the Muslim countries. Just like Christian countries have a shared history, Muslim countries have a shared history. You know, I'm Korean American. I was born in South Korea. I immigrated to the United States when my father accepted the call to be a senior pastor of a Korean church, First Korean Presbyterian Church of Philadelphia. Um, and so our family immigrated, but I'm ethnically Korean uh, and I went to Korean church all my life. Uh, and so, um, well, Korean churches were my home churches. Although when I was in England, I went to uh, St. Andrews the Great, Stag, where a lot of Cambridge Christians went. Hi everyone at Stag. Uh, while I'm at it, let me say hello to everybody in England who were at Cambridge University when I was there. Um, I miss all of you guys. I hope you guys are, are doing fine. I hope none of you are dead from COVID. Uh, hopefully I'll see you again soon in the near future. But yeah, so hello everybody from St. Andrews the Great in Cambridge. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, just looking at um, Muslim history, uh, we, we are reminded of one thing. Uh, as Christians, God allowed Muslim countries to defeat Christians. And that goes back to what I was saying, uh, with the first temple being destroyed by, by Babylonians. Uh, Jeremiah says that God raised up enemies of Israel to destroy Israel. And we're talking about potentially 80% of the land of Israel getting killed, dying, either through war, famine, you know. Um, through conquest, right? Many of them becoming slaves and sold off as slaves, which some people consider less, worse than death. Because that's what happens in a war, right? At, at those times. If you get conquered, you become slaves of the conquerors. And you get sold as slaves throughout the world. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. So Jeremiah and Isaiah if you go and read these books, now you, you are at home, you should be reading more Bible. If you read Jeremiah, then you see that God, Hashem of the Bible, gave power to your enemies in order to punish you for breaking God's law. Yeah, some of you may be thinking like, what the heck? Yes. You may be like, a deer with headlight or flashlight just kind of being shone on your eyes. Yes, God does not love you unconditionally. Yes, it's just like having headlight shone on your eyes. God does not love you unconditionally. I have to repeat that again. Because that is true. God does this, according to the book of Jeremiah. God doesn't only not love you unconditionally. God's going to treat you like he hates you. If you go, you go against God's law. That's right. God's going to treat you like he hates you. Even though you're a chosen people of God, even if you're a chosen nation, God's going to act like he hates you and give power to your enemies according to the book of Jeremiah and book of Isaiah. Yes, you feel like you're having flash like shone on your eyes. You're probably looking like a deer with the headlight right now. But someone has to tell you because this is what Jeremiah says and this is what Isaiah says. Just because your TV preachers are lying to you and saying God loves you unconditionally, 
Whatever you do, that's not the fact, because fact is found in the Bible. And in the book of Jeremiah and Isaiah, it says God raised, it, raised up enemies of Israel, the chosen nation of Israel, in order to destroy it. We're not talking about just chastening. We're talking about complete destruction of a nation. Israel existed one day, voila! Tomorrow Israel ceased to exist. What do you call that? And the book of Jeremiah says God did this to punish Israel. Does that sound like love to you? Does it sound like unconditional love to you? Unconditional love? Yeah, maybe you do need flashlight shone on your eyes if you think that's unconditional love. Obviously, you don't understand English. What is the definition of unconditional love? Is it unconditional love when God destroys a nation that he says he loves because that nation supposedly stopped following the word of God, Torah? Does that sound like unconditional love to you? That's what happened to Israel. Jeremiah and Isaiah says God raised up Israel's enemies to destroy Israel because Israel went away from God. That's just the way God is. That's who God is. You may not like that God, but that's the God of the Bible. So if you're going to call yourself a Christian, this is your God. God loves you when you follow his word, and God's going to act like he hates you and punish you like he hates you, like destroying your nation, destroying your business, destroying your house, if you do not do what he wants you to do. That's just who God is. We see that all over the Bible. So you're going to tell yourself that Bible's wrong, that this is not God, that God is an unconditionally loving God? Yes. Wake up. Wake up. Yeah, I think you need like a flashlight moment. Wake up. You need to wake up from your fiction, fantasy world, and read Romans chapter 1, which says the same, the wrath of God. That's what Romans 1 says. What do you, inter what do you think wrath of God is? You think that's unconditional love? Jeremiah, read through it. Does that sound like unconditional love to you? God raising up your enemies against you? We're talking about Babylonian army invading Israel, killing Israeli soldiers, um, and then occupying Israel, destroying everything in sight, stealing the treasures of the nation, raping the women, uh, killing the children, raping and then killing the women. Does that sound like unconditional love of God? And the book of Jeremiah said, it is God who gave power to Babylonians to do this. So we realize that sometimes God raises up enemies of his people in order to punish his people. And that principle is a very Bible-centered principle. It's what we call the biblical truth. And your preacher should be preaching this to you on Sundays instead of giving you false hope. Because the only way you're going to get out of your predicament if is if you give God what he wants, he's going to give you what you want. But if nobody's telling you what God wants, then how do you know? Well, it's written in the Bible, so you can read it for yourself. But preachers on Sunday should be preaching what is right, what they should be preaching. Whether you're Catholic priest, uh, pro pro Protestant clergy preacher, TV preacher, or Orthodox church preacher, you should be teaching the Bible, right? Because 
how are people going to be saved if they don't know how to be saved from their predicament? Don't you want to know how you're going to survive this, get out of this situation? From a spiritual angle, that's what I'm explaining right now. Look at the Iberian Peninsula in 711, that's Spain. It was conquered by Umayyad Caliphate, which is a Muslim caliphate. And we go to uh, Jerusalem, uh, to the Holy Land, Accra. It was occupied by Mamluk Sultanate, which is in Egypt at 1291. And Constantinople of the Byzantine Empire was conquered in 1452 by the Ottoman Empire, which is also Muslim Empire. So you see all these Muslim nations, empires, successfully conquering Christian nations and killing a lot of Christians in the process? Were they punishments from God? If we read it through a book of um, uh, Jeremiah, there's high likelihood that it is. People in those lands or people who are represented by them were perhaps not following the word of God and God punished them for it. You need to understand how God is and how he operates. And so this is a very important principle that you need to understand. And this is a very important principle that can help save you and your family. So I hope that you will join me in my political campaign for U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District um, to oppose gay marriage, oppose homosexuality for Virginia's 8th District, and for United States of America. Because we know from Romans chapter one, this is what God wants from us. And this is the way America used to be when we were the country of prosperity and wealth. Homosexuality was illegal. Gay marriage was illegal. That's when America was wealthy and it was a land of milk and honey. Now look at our country. What do you want to do? Do you want to go to the promised land? Or do you want to wander in the wilderness? You decide. You decide. I'm just giving you the spiritual guidance that is in the Bible. You can read for yourself. But I'm just saying the obvious that's in the Bible. So read Romans chapter one for yourself. You decide what you want. You want to go to the promised land? Or do you want to stay in the wilderness? That's your choice. Uh, I should tell you, however, that out of all the Israelites who came out of Egypt, only two entered the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. Everyone else, from that generation died in the desert. They wandered in the desert for 40 years, eating manna and quail, two food items for 40 years. How would you like to eat two same food items for 40 years? And it's a distance of less than 40 days travel, one month. You could travel from Egypt to Israel, and they wandered in the desert for 40 years as God made them to. Because, you know, they were following the pillar of fire. So God was just making them wander around in the desert for 40 years. And part of it is because they kept building the golden calf and not following the Bible and God's word. That's who God is. A distance of one month. Could have delivered them to the promised land, give them prosperity and joy and happiness. But because God 
never loves unconditionally, was punishing Israelites by leading a pillar of fire in circles in the, in the wilderness, in the desert, with two food items, quail and manna. That's who God is. God always loves conditionally. Had Israelites not built a golden calf, had they followed God's word, maybe they would have gone to the promised land in a couple months. So that's where you are. Are you going to give God what he wants? Or are you going to just keep doing what you're doing? Believing what you're believing. And if what you're believing and what you're doing is against God's word, Romans chapter 1, there's a problem. There's a serious problem. Because we know God never loves unconditionally. So as you know, my official political position is I stand against homosexuality and gay marriage. And as I said, you, get, you elect me to US Congress. Uh, the very first thing I'm going to do is get my colleagues together in both Republican and Democratic Party to uh, create a bill uh, to illegalize gay marriage in America. That would be my first action. That would be the uh, priority. Um, we need to get this country back to God. One nation under God, what does that mean? Uh, and so uh, I hope you will vote for me on November 3rd, 2020, and help me lead you and lead the nation back to God. And that's the right thing to do. I hope that your family will be well, and that your children will be well, and that you will survive COVID-19. And I hope that this show was helpful to you in thinking and reflecting about things that are important that other people have not told you yet. Uh, because these are things that we need to think about in order to survive COVID-19. I hope that you will be well and that your family will be well.